Keith, thank you so much for for joining us on the on the show today. I really appreciate your time and and jumping on. I guess I'd I'd love to start with a little bit about your background and 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 a little bit about sort of what where you've been and and what's led you to to where you are today. Yeah, that that's a huge topic. I've been everywhere. Um, I I guess I I started off in training and development when I was in the Marine Corps. One of my jobs was a water survival instructor. Oh, wow. so that's where I first got the bug to get up in front of adults and and teach them. So, you know, we were teach them water survival techniques in some cases, uh, how to swim. I mean, you know, very fundamental. Um, my primary job was an intelligence analyst. So I used to get up in front of a lot of people and members of Congress and defense wow. department. And yeah, as a young kid, right. So pr- pretty heady, heady stuff. Um, so when I got out of the Marines, I, I went and got my undergrad in sociology. I got my uh, graduate degree in leadership and organizational effectiveness. And I've kind of grown up in the learning and development world and expanded into organizational development and talent management before talent management was even a phrase. <laughs> so really started with learning management systems back in the, the late 90s and then I was with Tiffany and company for almost 11 years leading learning and development for their operations and and security (laughs) personnel. So a lot of brick and mortar training, a lot of live classroom training, and I really wanted to implement my first LMS. So that's why I left Tiffany's and a couple of years after that ended up leading L&D for Neiman Marcus in Dallas, Texas. And really started to bridge the gap between learning and performance and succession and kind of connecting the dots. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so been in high end specialty retail, been in hospitality, I've been in financial services. And now I'm, I'm guess, back into what most people would consider hospitality um, with my current organization, which is an, an adventure sports organization based out of Utah. So just having a lot of fun. Yeah, wow, what a varied, what a varied career. Sort of starting, starting out in in the Marines and, and working your way through to, um, to to retail and, and hospitality. People, I think, have uh, a little bit of an underlying assumption sometimes that uh, their industries are, are very different, um, and there's very different sort of takes and ways to do things. Um, I personally haven't found that. So I personally found that there's actually common threads amongst everything. And and you have one of the most varied careers, I think, I've uh, to go from the military to, to Tiffany & Co. as an example. Uh, they, they seem at surface level like quite different organizations, and, and they obviously are. But are there any sort of underlying threads that that you've seen cross, cross across different industries within L&D that you think are worth sort of mentioning? Yeah, I, I'd agree with that statement. I think people are people, no matter what industry yeah. or business you're in. Uh, you know, I tell people, don't con- I don't consider myself a, a learning and development or talent management leader. I consider myself a business executive. I just happen to solve problems through people development. And I, I think a lot of my colleagues would be better served in thinking in those terms, right? Because we get so focused on measuring our impact based on Kirkpatrick levels of evaluation when the business could care less about that, right? Did we solve their business problem is really all they cared about at the end of the day. So I think the, you know, cultures are unique, the businesses are unique, but we're still dealing at the very fundamental level with helping people unlock their potential. And Mm. how are we aligning the skills of the organization to impact the business in a way that you know the strategic goals have been set by the board or the or the leadership team so i think a lot of that is what we all find in any organization i mean l and d sits in a very opportune position with an organization when we're doing the needs analysis we get to scan the entire business environment and you know, looking for the root cause of, of a solution rather than addressing a symptom, right? We we want to address the root cause of it so it's it's sustainable, it's impactful, it's measurable. But we we're often put in a position where we uncover things that aren't just learning issues. They might be process issues or infrastructure issues, policy issues. And we get to herd cats and we get to 
get the right people in the room and say, hey, look, you know, we someone came to us with what they thought was a training problem. Training is just a small part of the overall solution. Y'all need to talk to one another and figure out some of the operational issues, whether it's sales or IT or compliance or operations. So I think that's a unique position and something that L&D finds itself with no matter what the industry, no matter what the organization. Yeah, absolutely. That's so true. And I think it's it's a fortunate position to be in, right? To, to It's kind of cool to get to look across the business. When, when you're doing that sort of needs analysis, are you trying to align your outcomes with business strategy? Is that sort of the, the base of that? Or are you sort of going directly to that unit and working with them? Well, it depends upon the, the relationship you've built within the organization and the credibility. And, and do people see you as a business partner or do they see you as a cost center? You know, it, <laughs> initially, most L&D teams will lament about people just come to us and it's very transactional, right? My 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 favorite story was at a high-end retailer who uh, the CHRO came to me and said, our customer sat and our NPS scores are really low. And I said, well, what's your lowest performing category? And she said, friendliness. Can you create a training program to address that? And with a straight face, I looked at her and said, okay, let me understand the ask here. You want me to teach grown adults how to be nice to one another? And I'll edit her response, but it was basically, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I said, oh, I agree. Can I ask some questions? Sure. How do you define friendliness? W what do you mean? Well, what are the behaviors that you're measuring? And by the way, are you interviewing and onboarding friendly people? Because you're not incentivizing friendliness because you've got your salespeople on 100% commission. She's like, oh my God, this is bigger than training. I'm like, yes, exactly. So for me, it's coming in with almost that consultative approach and helping the organization understand what we do, what we impact versus what we don't do. Because the last thing I want to do is just be very transactional and say, oh, I'll happily put that together knowing full well we didn't do our due diligence the likelihood that it's going to be successful is minimal. And then someone's going to complain that my training program didn't have the impact that was designed. So, you know, for me, it's it's working with the executive team on down and really helping them understand what we do, how we do it, how how we can partner with them. You know, when, whenever someone comes to me and says, Keith, I need a training program, the, the first thing that I hear in my head is, Hey, doc, I need a discectomy at L4, L5. Like, <laughs> no one walks into their doctor's office and says, here's the remediation that I need, right? You walk in and you say, my back hurts. What does the doctor do? He'll ask some questions. She'll take some tests. She'll have you do some strength exercises. She may order uh, an MRI, right? So we can separate the symptoms from the problem, which is couple herniated discs. And then together we come up with a remediation plan. Well, we can go full-blown surgery. Oh my God, that's crazy. I don't want surgery. Okay, well, you could do quarterly steroid shots. Ooh, I don't like needles. Well, you know what? Here's some Advil and some ice. <laughs> you know, that will address the set. And it, to me, that's the same thing that we do in an organization. Yeah. Hey, we need a new HRIS system. Oh, that's going to cost a million dollars. We didn't budget for that. Oh, okay. Well, I need to hire some more people because the data is bad and we're not getting the information. Oh, that's not going to work at all either. Okay. Well, we're going to have to put out more reporting and then our HR teams are going to have to, you know, give us the right information so we can, up oh, okay, I can live with that. Right. So to me, th that's our job. It's to help people separate again the symptoms from the problem so we can together put together the right remediation plan that's accepted by the organization that's efficient that's scalable and again is measurable and impactful yeah i really love that analogy of you don't walk into the doctor's office and say you know it's it's right here doc i know exactly what you need to do right you walk in you go something's wrong <laughs> I, need, I need a hand something's wrong please exactly yeah, that's 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 such a, a good way to put it in a, a bit of a different a bit of a different way than I've heard other people put it too. I, I really love that. 
once you've, I guess, under understood, you know, maybe what's a problem and what's a symptom and, and some done some differentiation there, do you have a process for identifying what activities you might look to engage to to actually roll out to to solve some of those issues and and going through, I guess, that that triage list that you mentioned before, where it was sort of like, look, we can start, you know, start up the top with surgery, but maybe that's 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 not it. But you know, hey, if you're comfortable with with this solution down here, then we we can run with that too. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, the first step is teaching uh, leadership or, you know, business executives how to go through a um, decision tree on separating uh, symptoms from problems, right? So I basically, it, it's a, it was a semester graduate course that I distilled down into a three hour workshop, right? Because no <laughs> one's going to go through a, you know, an eight week, 12 week course in business. So, um, it's starting with, you know, what's your goal? What's the outcome? What do you look, why do you even need to, why are we having this conversation? Yeah. Right. So, okay. What's everything that's uh, wrong, right? What's preventing you from, right? I want to go water skiing. What's preventing you? My back hurts. I can't move this way. Right. So going back to my, the back analogy, it's the same way. Okay. I, so practical example, my last role, Hey, I want our sales, our new hire sales professionals to sell more out of training. Okay. What's more mean? Well, they're selling 29,000. I want them to sell 60. Okay. So you want to double. Well, what's getting in the way of that? They don't understand our products. They're not comfortable in offering suggestive selling or creative solutions. They're not right. We go down the list. Okay. Then I work with my ID team, my instructional designers. Let's create a program that addresses this. Now, there may be other components. There may be, we're not recruiting the right people. Well, why? Well, we're having a tough time in this market because the compensation isn't aligned. Great. Let's get with HR and the comp team to see if we can do something about in incentives if we can't work up the bonus, right? Nothing to do with L&D, but that's, that's a pipeline issue about, okay, again, holistically, what's everything that's preventing us from being successful? So then it's sitting down with those groups and saying, hey, here's what I'm working on, but here's your piece of the pie. Is this something you're interested in? Can you devote time and attention to that? And that happens all the time. So we went from looking for you know, a 2X improvement, $60,000 out of training, and, and our first couple of classes were coming out selling $130,000 out of yeah, training. Right. That's amazing. What a result. Well, but but that's the goal, right? It wasn't. We need training. Why? Well, because we don't have training. Okay, great. But <laughs> what's the result, right? What are you, we, we should not rest on the fact that it's too hard to measure the impact of L&D programs. No other part of the organization gets away with that. Yes. We shouldn't either. We need to be held accountable to the same KPIs as the organization is. I'm here to solve business problems. I'm not here to make I do make fun training, but that's not the goal, right? The goal isn't to make it fun. The goal is to make it impactful. Yeah, that that's amazing. I think what you what you've said there and landed on around KPIs and how for for some reason it, and it's hard. I get it. It is really hard in L and D, but um, you know, aligning with that ROI, I think, is where you start to get that engagement with senior leadership and where you can then probably sort of snowball a bit, right? So if you do unlock a little bit of that ROI, then they're more willing to probably listen to you the next time around and the next time around. Exactly. You build that credibility, you build that relationship. But, uh, you know, Blake, I think in a lot of cases, saying it's hard is a cop-out yeah. because the the business, it's almost, we complain we don't have a seat at the table, but then we're not showing our value. Mm. It, it's, we're not, we're not advocating for anyone to hold us accountable like the rest of the business. And I would say, you know, most of the time the business comes and says, we have this enterprise-wide problem. I need you to have an enterprise-wide solution when we should be saying, you know what, can I alpha and beta test this yep. with a pilot group so I can isolate and control all the variables so I know the results are due only to what we're bringing to the table. Yep. That way we can QA at the end of the day, if there's any improvements, which there hopefully will be, no one else is taking credit for that. It, you know, marketing's not coming along. Finance isn't coming along. Oh, we have a new price structure. Oh, we have new commercials or new print. Great. 
we did this with a pilot group and we're comparing it against everyone else. So you can't take credit for that. And it's not a, he said, she said, or look at me. It's, that's the only way we're going to get that credibility if we can isolate our impact. And the only way to isolate it is to do it with, with test groups. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's such a great way to put it. Um, when, when you are isolating with those test groups, are you sort of b- beforehand going through a bit of a process around <laughs> putting together like a budget or, or some form of um, proposal higher up the chain? And is there a way that you've, you've found to sort of, I guess, start to show or justify some of that ROI prior to to that testing? Yeah, so it depends upon, I hate to be give the consultant answer, it depends, right? But it <laughs> does, it depends, right? What are, what are we doing? Because a lot of times the budget is just human resources, right? If I have an internal design team, I am just giving them a project to work on. So I'm not using external support where I, I may need a budget for that. Um, we had underperforming sales teams that the organization felt was a function of leadership. Yep. So I took the underperforming stores, their leadership teams through uh, an assessment and then a workshop and then measured pre-workshop, post-workshop sales figures, not only within their areas, but also compared to their peers who didn't go through the same intervention we saw five point increases on wow. sales percentages with the team, the teams that we worked on. So we moved these underperforming locations from below the midpoint to above the midpoint and very minimal investment. Really the investment was my time in running a workshop and there was a small external investment of an assessment that we ran to get an understanding of team dynamics. But Again, very, very small from a budgetary consideration, but the impact more than paid for that investment. And then we established the credibility and we showed this again, we're showing sales increases. So mm. you, you can't get better than that from yeah, uh, yeah. demonstrating impact. Yeah, absolutely. What a what a simple way to do it though, right? Like you're just taking two groups, we're gonna run these guys through the training, these ones we're not, and the results can kind of speak for themselves there. I, I really, I really like that approach. Um, and I think it's something that everyone can implement. Do you, do you find that technology when you're sort of doing that process is something that plays a big role? Are you, are you sort of using different tech stacks to, to run that AB testing or is it something where it's more of, you know, you, you're just sort of managing that on a ad hoc project basis because that context maybe does matter a little bit more and, and there isn't a, like a perfect solution for you to, to do that. Well, I, I've, my feeling about technology is it should be an enabler, right? You don't build your strategy around technology. You need to take it into consideration because it's obviously a significant investment. But, you know, learning and development's been around long before the technology's been around. So in a lot of these cases, and some of these examples I'm referring to, the there was no technology other than the online assessment, which could have been done manually. If you know, if someone put a gun to my head and said, "We're not going to pay for this," I, I, I could have figured out a way. But the rest of it was, you know, a two-day workshop with me facilitating. Yeah. Um, so, for some of these, no technology is not an issue. But Absolutely. again, these are. It depends upon the industry. It depends upon the culture. It depends upon the business. If I'm, you know, we're in a post-pandemic yeah. world now. So distributed remote workforces are now more the norm than they have been. So how am I getting instruction to a distributed team? I'm not flying them all into a conference center anymore. Yeah. We're, we're doing it, you know, through technology. So their technology can help make these more efficient. But again, these things were all needed way before we ever had the, the luxury of the technology. Yeah, absolutely. And it should it should be something that I think, like you said, enables and empowers you to to move forward, not so much um, the thing that you build your whole strategy around. Like you said, I think that's that's so true. Um, in, in terms of, I guess, that distributed workforce that you mentioned, 
how how do you manage the the capability of of that workforce? Is, is that something that you you sort of work on to to map skills or, or anything on on that front? Is that something where you've sort of looked into? You've mentioned some like pretty fantastic results. I imagine your your executive team are pretty happy when you come and you go, hey, our sales are up a bit over double, guys. I think I think that's 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 pretty awesome. Um, do you do you drill down into the skill sets that those people people have and and benchmark or baseline them and 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 how do you how do you sort of go about that process? So now you're getting into the technology, right? So oh, so yes. I will I will so this is how you can leverage technology from um, a skill assessment <clears throat> and utilization perspective. So there are products on the market where you can. So there's learning management systems, which are siloed independent system. And then there's talent management systems where learning management systems may be a part of a broader tech stack, such as succession planning, performance management, um, competency assessments, career planning, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So when we, and this is what we've done in the past, is we've taken validated job descriptions. We've kind of isolated, okay, what are the skills required to be successful in this role? We build a competency model with leveled behaviors around that, right? Because communication skills are important at every level of the organization, but someone that's on the phone eight hours a day, it's going to be more transactional versus the C-suite, which may be more strategic and more visionary. Same competency, different behaviors. So we align the models and the behaviors to the role. And as part of a talent management suite, we could then link the learning resources on the LMS side to the competency and behaviors on the performance side. So now we can start either doing self-assessments mm -hmm. and from a career pathing standpoint, I'm in this role. I noticed that the organization's posted a role that's outside my hierarchy. That's really interesting. Let me take a competency assessment to see where my gaps are. And oh, amazing. The system is recommending a development plan because it recognizes the gaps and pulls those resources and presents them to me. Absolutely. Or conversely, high post selection. We're going to assess people based on this. We could use observation checklists. We can use job task analysis, whatever we want. And we could say, in current role, here's some gaps in your performance. And the system, again, is going to recommend these, um, these, these offerings for you to remediate those. All in the background now, the HR business partners or the HR teams or the business teams could now actively see who has what skills, who's working towards closing what skills, do they align with future needs of the organization. Now, maybe I want to put these people in, in talent groups or pools, and I've seen some organizations where they need to know every shift, who has what skills, so if they're doing you know, some OSHA regulations around lockout tag out, or they need somebody that's CPR qualified on every shift, and they're trying to do workforce management, they could leverage the skill capability and identification in our learning and talent systems to see, oh, okay, here's, here's who I have at my disposal versus wondering and hoping if they have the right people available. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's such a fantastic way to go about it. And I imagine you you probably end up with a pretty good database then of of the organization. And and I can see a lot of possible uses, but what, what are some other uses that you've seen sort of come out of that that might be a little bit left of field, you know, where you thought, oh, hey, we actually have this data. We can solve this problem really quickly now because we've we've done this this mapping and assessment process. So it very high level, and this wasn't a data mapping exercise, just shows you the capabilities of the system. Mm -hmm. We had just launched this at Neiman Marcus back in, I want to say 2010, 2011, and we were opening up e-commerce in China. Yeah, wow. And I pulled everyone's resume information in. So I had, I had knowledge, skills, ability. I had a ton of data points, learning courses, performance evaluations, right? Uh, hypo identification through succession plan, like all of the, all of this at our fingertips. She called, I'm on speakerphone, I'm in the system. And she said, Hey, Keith, I know this is a crazy question to ask, but you know, we just opened e-commerce in China. And I'm like, Oh, I know where she's going. So I'm already typing. Yeah. And she said, I'm just curious, is there any way for us to tell how many Mandarin speakers we have 
Yeah. And I said, I said, we have five. Would you like them over the phone now? Or should I email you their contact information? She says, you just kn you knew that at the top of your head. And I said, no, I can't remember <laughs> what I had for breakfast. Yeah. It's right there in the system for me. And then that, oh, okay. And I said, yeah, let me, you know, let's talk about this because do you want just Mandarin speakers or would you like Mandarin speakers who have had, uh, who have a college degree mm -hmm. in a certain, in a certain area or do you also want to know and or um, have they taken any leadership development courses or have they received an exceeds or better in their last three performance reviews? She's like, all right, you're just showing off now. I'm like, yes, I'm just making <laughs> the point that whatever data point you want, we can pull from the system because that's and that to me, that's the advantage of a talent management system over an isolated learning management system, because now we can aggregate these data points and have a collection of people based on on those different points. So let's say, oh, we want to open up a new location in um, in Oregon. Great. What are the parameters? What's the search parameters? So now I could do. And I used to call it the the Car Max Buyer's Guide, right? Because yeah. <laughs> then I could put in all of these feature sets, all these data sets, and it will return me. A, a, a list of of people from a hundred percent match down to zero, and now maybe I only had people at seventy five percent. Great, let's pull them in and, and target those areas of development. So yeah. when we're ready to open, we've got staff that are that have identified through succession planning. Hey, I'm willing to relocate to Oregon. That's a data point that I can pull into that search. Yeah, what a fantastic sort of database to to have of people. Did you find that the retention of staff sort of was affected positively because you could identify opportunities for them internally? Like I'm, I'm a big believer of it should be easier to get a new job at your current workplace than it is at a new workplace, right? Um, <clears throat> so, but to do that, it's hard, right? If you don't have that data in particular, it's it's, it's incredibly difficult. Did you see any positive sort of momentum on a, on a staff in front from that? From an engagement perspective, yes. I mean, every every engagement survey that I've ever been a part of in every single organization, the number one or number one or number two opportunity is going to be I want more learning and development. Yeah. Um, yeah. From my employer, and we've seen those numbers positively impacted when we do things like this because now we're directing people to say, Hey, look, go look at the open roles on our internal website. Go take a competency assessment if you're interested in that role. See how far you are, you are away from it from a skill gap perspective. And now the system is going to recommend a learning path for you. So you can now take control of your career and you could start working towards that. And then we wrap that around coaching opportunities and mentoring opportunities. And because it's not just I'm going to check the box, take these learnings and I'm going to you know be the next CHRO. Right. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, what do we need to do as individuals? It's not this straight vertical climb anymore. It's more of a lattice, right? I need to be well-rounded. I need to understand other parts of the organization. I don't, I don't know IT as well as I should. Maybe I could find some projects that I could work on as part of my development to better understand what they do. So um, yeah, we see increases in engagement. I can't give you retention numbers, but I, I know that it definitely reflects itself on the employee engagement survey. Yeah, and if people are engaging, look, they're, they're more than likely more willing to stay on, right? Because they're more engaged. I think yeah, you could probably um, draw that line, not probably too strictly, but I, I'd say it's a, it's a decent assumption. You mentioned uh, that at the, at the start there that you know, during those survey processes, right, people always say they want more L&D opportunities. I feel like that's that's the the default answer that everybody goes to. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I feel like there's a, there can be a little bit of a gap between the engagement of learning opportunities and the outcome of people asking for more. Why do you why do you think that is? You know, why why do you think that sometimes they don't get consumed when there are a lot of learning opportunities, um, and those things aren't necessarily linked together, and in particular. The world at the moment, right? You can go and off the shelf buy probably ten thousand courses if you go to one of those big vendors. Um, but there's some some something around consumption there that's that's it feels not quite right. I, my experience has been, uh, it's not a field of dreams. If you build it, they're not coming. Yeah. If you provide ten thousand learning objects in in an LMS, the reaction we've heard is, I don't even know where to begin. That's too much. 
and people are dissuaded. I think you need to target specific areas for training. It needs to be relevant. It needs to be performance support. If, if I've stated that my career path is from where I am now to CHRO, I need to be presented with learning opportunities that fall within my area of interest. And I don't need all of this other extraneous stuff. Now it's there. And maybe if I'm, my feeling with hypo talent is uh, they're going to find a way. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to find a way. Whether we provide them, I've never once said to my boss, gee, I don't know how I'm going to accomplish this project you just gave me. I might be thinking that, but yeah. <laughs> those words are not coming out of my mouth, right? I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to go to LinkedIn. I'm going to find someone that I can collaborate with. I'm going to study, I'm going to learn, and I'm going to present myself that I'm a, a, a competent, qualified individual. So I think internally, we see hypo talent does that. Like we don't need to train those people. They're going to find a way. I think for everyone else, we just can't blast them with volumes of content. We need to be very prescriptive and targeted. It, it's this, it's this push-pull. If we're sending recommendations and suggestions that are relevant to them, we've seen more engagement with those courses than the, and and you're not off on that ten thousand, learning yeah. you know learning object offering. I've done that. I've had catalogs of twelve thousand learning objects. Now wow. some of them, not just e-learning, they're audio books and they're PDFs and they're you know they're all sorts of distributed material. But again, it's it's overwhelming when you do that. I, I think the best way to approach it is to be very targeted and make it extremely relevant to the individual's needs. Yeah, absolutely. And is, is are you sort of going back to those those skills and those capabilities, competencies that you've measured to make those relevant? Is is that normally the, the link there, or is there another sort of path that you've taken? Well, I think it's it's that. I mean, the skills need to be relevant, right? But most people don't think in terms of skills most people it's it's sure. just in time need like i don't know how to do a v lookup yeah <laughs> yeah that's not going to be in any competency model right and it used to drive me nuts early in my career i'm like uh go to google type in v lookup you're going to get a 30 second video i don't need to pull you out and put you in a training course right um so <laughs> it's it's this we, you know, we need to find those areas of performance support, which people need in the moment without asking, you know, IT the same question over and over or asking L&D the same question over and over, right? How do we, how do we give people easy access to the information from a skill perspective, but then also from a role perspective, right? So, um, you know, most people would say I'm a good, you know, not me personally, you know, I'm a good communicator. Well, what does that mean? How are we defining communication, right? Um, or um, I'm a first-time supervisor. I don't know how to give feedback, right? Just taking an e-learning course on that may not be enough. There needs to be some follow-up and some practice and encouragement and some role plays, right? That I'm not going to get just from taking e-learning. Um, and I might not even, again, it's the old statement, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm a new, I'm an, and unfortunately a lot of people, well, I got promoted to supervisor. So I'm going to keep doing what I've always done because it got pre me promoted. They don't even have the realization that, oh no, 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 no. What you did as an individual contributor will derail you as a supervisor because yeah. now you're working through others versus it being, you know, your own effort. So now your behaviors need to change. Your skills need to change. You need to think of you know, what your role is, is completely different. So I think, you know, it's up to us to help people with those transitions hmm. from individual contributor to first-time supervisor, to mid-level, to senior. Those are major points in a person's career progression if they go down the people leadership side, where I think it's really incumbent upon us as, as an organization to really help people understand how to, how to make those transitions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that what what you mentioned around hey like e-learning is probably not going to solve that right it, it's it's going to help and it's a contributing factor but it's not the only the only sort of out the only way to get that that outcome that you're after have you seen any other sort of 
um, styles of learning work really well. I know I spoke to the guys at um, Kathmandu. It's a, it's a shop out of New Zealand. They have a bunch of retail stores and they have like a fantastic coaching program and they made everybody, their, their goal is everybody's a coach. If you're a supervisor, you're actually a coach and and this is how they go about it. And it's it's really cool. Um, have you seen any practical examples or examples of, of something that's maybe a little bit outside the box in terms of some other learning sort of opportunities that's worked really well? Um. Yes, I, you know, one of the examples I was alluding to before was based on Patrick Lencioni's table group. It's called Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Yep. And it's really absolutely. reframing. Are you sure. familiar with it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we we, we use it a lot at, at, at our work and, and, you know, foundation being trust. And then you start to say, oh, conflict's really positive. <laughs> Actually, we want conflict, but we want healthy conflict because we need to challenge our ideas. Otherwise, we don't get the best idea. And, and you know, that action's up to results. So, yes, super familiar. and and completely a believer, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I started out as a participant, um, in a workshop because I was part of a very, 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 did I say very dysfunctional leadership team? Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't, we wouldn't just, you know, run over, you know, back over somebody with a bus, we'd go forward and then back again to make sure the job was, done. I mean, it was just cut, it was cutthroat. It was, it was a terrible environment. So, <laughs> we recognize the need that we had to do something. We went through it. So now I say, you know, I'm not just the the hair club for president. I'm a member too. So, you know, when I've used the workshop, it's great because I come from a place of, hey, this worked for me. This isn't just theoretical. This is actionable. And for me, my favorite part of, of the pyramid is the accountability and reframing accountability and teaching people on a team. I always tell people, all right, it's one of the questions that I ask during the workshop. How many of you feel that you're part of a team and everyone raises their hands? And I'm like, you are so not part of the team because what would you do right now if uh, one of your teammates wasn't doing their job? Would you say something to that person? And they're like, oh no, that's not my job. That's the boss's job. I'm like, well, then you don't understand what it means to be on a team. And I'm very limited in my analogies. I have a military background and a sports background, right? So, um, <laughs> Amer American football, yeah, right. If a if a lineman misses a block and the quarterback is sacked, do you think they're waiting to have a conversation with with the coach when they go to the sideline, or do you think that there's a very robust conversation happening in the huddle, right? Yeah. Somebody's grabbing somebody by the face mask, going. Dude, you missed your block. If you ever do that again, you're not going to hear the end of it from us, right? It's right. immediate feedback to correct the behavior. And everyone understands it's for the betterment of the team to get the results we're looking for. So helping teams understand accountability isn't the boss's job. It's everyone's job. And you could do it in a constructive way where you can pull someone aside and say, hey, from a charitable assumption standpoint, dude, you seem to be really struggling here. What's going on? How can I help? Yes. Right. Take it from that place of, I want, you know, you've always been awesome at this. I notice it's slipping. It's affecting our results. Let's not go talk to the boss. Let's you and I work this out. So I think that helps to me why I love it so much, because it really helps to set the stage on having the culture that you want. You yeah. want to build that trust. You want to have that teamwork. You want to feel that you can come to work and you don't have to play CYA, you know, cover your backside. It's, it's, I know that people have my back and I'm going to have theirs. So I, I think workshops that engender that type of culture are going to be extremely impactful in the right organizations. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't echo that more. We've we've seen tremendous results from from using the five dysfunctions of a team. And I think the just the underlying approach is probably at face value. You don't realize when you read read the pyramid, but once you break it down, like you said, said no, this is actually what accountability means, and and this is what what trust means, and this is what conflict means. Um, these words aren't bad words; they're actually awesome words. And we need to. We're all together, and you know, if we have a foundation of trust, then you know that when I'm saying, "Hey, man, what's going on over here?" It's not coming from a place of like, it's coming from a place of like, how do we how do we solve this problem together? Have Have you seen that? that uh, approach take a, a team that might not have have that trust and performance and culture and, and and change it have you seen it at work in real time amazingly yeah so yeah. i implemented it i implemented it at 
a, an organization with underperforming teams and we watch the sales increases but the the which is validation right but for me the the fun part is this is self sustainable mm-hmm. you know i do a one day a two day workshop when i'm done they never need to see me again so we did a pre assessment a post assessment to get an understanding of how the team feels about the team so we went from completely red pyramids yeah. <laughs> for, for, those, for those that are watching, the pyramid is the five levels of dysfunction. It's put in a pyramid. And if you do an assessment, it's a traffic light. It's red, yellow, green, right? So based on the scoring. And we've gone from completely red to completely green, which is a you know, pat on the back for the team. Yeah. But then when you look at the resulting sales increases, now you see what the, the business impact. Because it's one thing, mm-hmm. oh, everyone feels better about the team. Oh, great let's do trust falls right that, that's yeah. not we're, that's not why we're doing it right we're doing it because we want a business mm-hmm. outcome um so yeah so i and what i ended up doing with these teams who are very nervous about holding one another accountable um we i had each one of them come up with their own safe word so yeah. if they needed to have a conversation with a colleague they would say instead of saying hey let's go for coffee which could mean let's go for coffee it'd be like Hey, you want to go grab some popcorn? And then the person on the receiving end would go, okay, let me calm down here. I know what's about to happen. Let me prepare myself. This isn't going to be a bad conversation. I might be called out on some behaviors, but I'm being called out because this person is interested in me. If they didn't care about me as a colleague, they wouldn't want to have this conversation and they'd let me fail. So it's, it's that reframing that makes it sustainable and now you hold the leader accountable. So every team meeting, first five minutes, let's talk about the five dysfunctions. How are we doing? I mean, I remember the first time I went through it, we went through the course and then one of my buddies who was called out on this, he never complained or offered a dissenting view during the meeting. It was always afterwards. Yeah. He called me up. He's like, that was a bunch of garbage. I can't believe that he's doing that. So when he, he, That came out as a behavior he wanted to change. So the first time he did that after a meeting, I'm like, Charlie, he's like, what? I'm like, dude, next meeting, you're going to have to go tell everyone you fell off the wagon. It was like an AA intervention. (laughs) He's like, I, he goes, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do it. If you don't do it, I'm going to call you out. Yeah. He's like, dude, you know, dude, we're friends. I'm like, no, this is more important than our relationship. This is the team dynamics. Sure enough. Next, next time we had a team meeting, he's like, all right, I slept up. Here's what I did. And everyone was just so appreciative that he came forward and, you know, it was, everyone was encouraging and it, it works. It really works. Yeah. That's great. What, what a great story. And I think that when you, you know, I think that the team would have appreciated that. Right. And then in the long run, he probably thanks you for that, that hard decision. Right. And, and for that, uh, for, for actually being like, hey, I'm I'm gonna stick to it. I'm gonna hold you accountable because <clears throat> in the long run, I think everybody everybody benefits from that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've got a bit of a tricky one for you for for coming coming to sort of a close. But you've got such a big a big career, uh, such a big and and varied career, and and uh, I've. I've really enjoyed I, the way that you look at things and the way that you look at the world. If you had to distill down sort of to, to somebody either new coming into HR or L&D, um, trying to be strate- strategic, what would you say the biggest lessons from your your career um, to date are that you would you would impact or impart on someone? Uh, I, the first thing that comes comes to mind is being right does not always mean it's going to work. Yeah. <laughs> or or it's or you're going to be effective. I think whatever we we need to take whatever we learn, whatever our discovery is, whatever our recommendations are, and they need to be framed in a business context. Because we might have the best solution in the world in our own minds, mm-hmm. but when we meet with stakeholders, if we're not going to get the buy-in for whatever reason, it it it's not advantageous to push something through that the organization has told you they're not going to buy into it. Even if you, you know, gun to your head, you know, this is the best thing ever and it's going to change. If it's not, if you can't influence and negotiate and get people to see it the way you do, then you need to consider other options. Again, 
we're in the business of solving business problems. So we need to think of ourselves as, as business leaders and business executives. Nowhere else in the business would it be acceptable to, to tell people, I don't care what you think. I'm the expert. We're doing it my way, right? And that's what they're going to hear. Um, and I've made that mistake numerous times in my career, right? So I've, I've, I've learned from my own hardship. So I think for me, it's really thinking about it from a, a business perspective first and then trying to align your solutions so they will be accepted and adopted and scalable and impactful. And, you know, did you have to sacrifice something? You may have, right? But are you still getting a positive result versus no result? And I think that's that's what more people need to look at it the way they should look at it. Yeah, fantastic. What a what a what a brilliant way to frame it, right? Because it's just it's just a change of perception, but it's so I think that's such, such an impactful change of, of, of perception. Um, and lastly, where can people find you if they want to uh, hear about a little bit more about some of some of what you've done, or maybe apply for for, for a job at one of the the wonderful organizations that you're currently working at? Um, where 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 can people reach out and and maybe say hello? Yeah, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. Um, it's my full name, Keith Meyerson. I think the only other Keith Meyerson that comes up on any Google search is an artist in New York. And I still get emails <laughs> asking about my artwork. Not, I am not the I am not the guy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, LinkedIn's probably the easiest, best way to find me. And um, I mean, I'm I love paying it forward. I love helping and sharing. And and my feeling has always been if if someone's going to devote their most sacred resource, which is time, into listening to what I have to say, I'm absolutely going to find the time um, to share that with them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to be to make myself available. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for, for spending spending some time with me today. And uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. You as well. This has been great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, you asked um, to have this conversation. It's been fun. I'm Blake Provitz, and you're watching the Strategic L&D Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with our latest releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you just want the audio, you'll find us on most common podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you again soon.